Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. Hopefully you all know by now, this is a monthly bonus podcast where we discuss a chess book. We bring in a guest co-host and discuss a chess book, and often it is of the sort of uh, instructive realm. But we wanted to switch things up this month, and we're going with a chess biography, Chess is My Life by legendary Soviet and then Swiss Grandmaster Viktor Korchnoi. And helping out this month is an old friend of mine, um, known each other for decades. He's been a stalwart of uh, the New York chess scene and the internet chess scene for a long time. Um, he has recently moved to uh, Missouri, but um, by day, he's the senior vice president of marketing at Glia, which is a digital communications platform. He is a dad. He is a member of the U.S. Chess Executive Board. He's also been a tournament organizer. He's a USCF expert. He was involved in the early days of the Internet Chess Club, a.k.a. the ICC. He was an admin, and then he was helping them arrange tournaments. He's got tons of stories, some of them even involving the aforementioned Korchnoi, which we will get to in all due, in due time. But we've got a lot to cover. But first and foremost, let's welcome John Fernandez to the show. John, what's going on? Ben, thanks for having me. It's a great honor. This is one of my favorite things to do is listen to your podcast. So this is great to be here. Thanks. Th- thank you. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's fun to do this with you. We've got a lot of uh, shared history of uh, poker games in your basement in New York City and uh, with uh, Greg Shahadi and Donnie Ariel and the list goes on. But but this is a business podcast, so we we won't ramble. We're uh, we're here to talk Korchnoi. Um, so. John, again, I know you've got stories and I kind of pushed you in the direction of doing this book. I kind of gave you a little <laughs> potting, but uh, what's what's your experience with uh, with chess is my life? Um, well, yes, certainly it's a it's a book I remember reading when it first came out. And obviously that that's that's some years ago now. Uh, but certainly Korchnoi kind of has this weird way of uh, if I think of kind of like phase one of my chess life from kind of like 1995 to, to 2004, you know, the people that I've been to the most countries with are like, number one is my wife. Number two is my father, my brother, and my mother. Number five is Victor Korchnoi. Like somehow <laughs> wherever I would go, he was there. And that's largely because this guy played everywhere and for a really long time was a huge legend. And so, you know, he's someone I got to spend some time with. And obviously I think one of the great legends of the game, certainly one of the most interesting people in kind of the history of the game and you know i'm sure we'll go into all those details but um he's a really really important chess player historically and i think um for me it's always been fascinating because i've had the personal experience but even if i never met this guy this book is certainly a a great great read yeah yeah i mean we might as well just say right off the top i think we're both going to recommend this book um it's not perfect. I do not recommend it for chess improvement. There are nine annotated games in it. And I actually really like his annotated style. It's to me, it's like the right level of analysis. You know, when we, when Nate Solon and I talked about Zurich 1953, um, sort of mentioned like a Bronstein, I felt like he had a little bit too light of a touch, but to me, Korshnoi is just right. But still, like the stories are so amazing and the games are so sporadically placed that like you're almost you don't even want to be bothered with them because the stories are so good. And because there's so many other resources to get Korchnoi's uh, analysis. And in fact, um, this was part of a three volume series where the other two are one is his games with white and the other is his games with black. Full disclosure, I haven't read those books, but my understanding is that those are uh, those are like straight up you know, game collections with his analysis. So this is the one that you come to like as like bedtime reading or whatever, when you want to think about chess, but not improve chess. And uh, in in my opinion, it it delivers. No, it totally does. No, no, no question about it. It's you know, certainly, you know, the, the, the 64 squares are very interesting, but the amount of stuff that goes into it, especially given, you know, this guy runs the legacy of the Soviet presence in chess. And you know, pretty much every historical figure crosses him, you know, since World War II. And so, you know, this guy's kind of, you know, you almost think of he's the guy who pops up everywhere. 
just no matter wh where you go, Courtney is there in some world championship cycle, some USSR championship, and even events up until, you know, pretty recently, um, the, the guy was always there. So it's, it's, it's kind of incredible how you just sort of will repeatedly see him throughout history. Yeah. I mean, and just to give a little more uh, biographical details, born in Leningrad, a.k.a. St. Petersburg, Russia, he's wildly considered, widely, excuse me, considered one of the best players to never have been world champion, along with people like Paul Karius, Akiba Rubinstein, David Bronstein. Born in 1931, he was the four-time USSR champion and then famously had a lot of difficulties in, in the USSR, um, um, felt you know, rightfully, he he felt oppressed. I mean, they basically he was denied opportunities to advance his chess career. And as John alluded to already, all all the guy wanted to do was play chess. So he emigrated to Switzerland in 1976. Um, he felt particularly um, he had bitter rivalries with especially Karpa, but also with Petrosian. Um, and just in terms of like his chess accomplishments, he's best known, of course, for two uh, world championship matches with Karpov, 1978 and 1981. He also played Karpov in 1974, which was a de facto world championship because it was the candidate's final. And it was already not clear if Fisher was actually going to play the person who won, Fisher being the, the person who had beaten Spassky in 1972 and in theory waiting to defend his throne, but already haggling over conditions and, of course, famously never came to an agreement. So three epic matches with uh, Karpov. Um, he was also just uh, an amazing and inspiring adult improver. He had his peak rating at the age of 48. Um, when he faced Karpov for the world championship in 78, he was age 46. Um, and when he faced him again in 81, that match wasn't as close, but he was age 49. He beat Fabiano Caruana um, at age, with Black at age 79 in like a really nice game. Um, at 75, he was the oldest ever top 100 player. Um, I mean, before we get to his personality, John, I mean, what what else is there to say about his chess accomplishments? I mean, it's just an, amazing. Well, th this guy is, he's the, he's the bridge in chess history, right? At the end of the day, he played 11 consecutive world champions. He played Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tal, Petrosyan, Spassky, Fischer, Karpov, Kasparov, Kramnik, Anand, Carlsen. The, old, the, most, the most recent world champion he didn't play was Maxova. Um, although they were in some tournaments together, it seems like they never played. Before Uva's Aliyekin, Capablanca, like he goes that far back in history. You know, I don't think he's played Nepo, given that we do have a world championship match coming up, um, you know, reasonably soon. But, you know, it, it's, I don't think anybody else played 11 world champions. I'd be shocked if there was. I can't imagine who that person, you know, would, would be. And, you know, I know you're a big basketball fan. You know, there's always a talk in basketball about like, the people that never had a ring. Uh, and there's certainly folks who, if they weren't ever world champions in chess, we would feel like the world championship title didn't mean anything. If Kasparov was never world champion, if Fisher was never world champion, it would like not make sense. But there are some world champions like we could live without, right? You know, where it wouldn't change the course of history. If Korshnoi was on that list of world champions, no one would bat an eye. He, you know, he kind of fits perfectly. He's the only person since Bogol Yubov in the 30s who played two world championship matches without becoming a world champion. Uh, and I, to your earlier point, you could argue he played three, right? So you're talking about someone who was unquestionably one of the top players of his day for a very long time. His longevity too is, is really what's, I think, really incredible. You, you talk about how some of his greatest achievements were in his late forties, great news for us, I think from a chess improvement perspective, but you know, it's certainly incredible. Just there's really not a character like him that you see in chess history. Um, and I think that's what makes this, this book and his story so interesting. Yeah. And in terms of like deconstructing, whatever the secret might've been for his longevity, um, you know, it's really hard to say. I don't think he was like solving puzzles when he was like 60, you know, but um, he just had this famous work ethic. I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't remember who it was that told the story on Perpetual Chess, but someone told a story of analyzing with him and not being able to keep up with him. You know, like he would want to put in like 11 hour days, even past the age of 50, um, whereas they, they were ready to be done. And obviously beyond the podcast, there's many, many stories like that. Um, so, I mean, just love of the game is, is, is a big part of it um of course we can't talk about it without talking about he's like absolutely infamous for having a, an abrasive personality being a very poor loser um 
Now, of course, going hand in hand with that, you one must mention he had an extremely difficult childhood. Uh, he grew up in a 13 room communal flat shared with 10 other families. Um, his mom basically wasn't around from his early years. And then his dad and his grandmother died in, in the siege of Leningrad um, and he was starving. He was hospitalized with uh, malnutrition. Um, so to come out from the other side of that obviously shapes your worldview. And yeah, we'll get to some of the stories. I mean, one thing you'd say about the book is uh, he doesn't sugarcoat any sort of rivalries, especially again with Petrosian and Karpov. But at the same time, he doesn't go out of his way to talk about all of like the obnoxious things he said in the, over the years. Um, but it, that could be its own book. So, so you can't fault the guy, really. He has a point of view. Look, we'll, we'll go to the stories I've been involved in some of his famous outbursts or infamous outbursts as, as the case may be. But yeah, I think this went a long way also to, to kind of understanding him. Right. And I think you know, at, the, at the end of the day, the title is actually a really good one. Chess is my life. That, that will explain, and we'll, we'll certainly talk about it th you know, throughout this podcast, but it, it's really, it was a glimpse into a lot of what makes him tick. And I think it's, I think that's always a great thing. You know, whatever you're reading about someone writing about themselves when they tell you sort of honestly where things come from. Um, and I think he really, you know, he really does that. It's, it's his truth, no doubt, but um, it's certainly great to see and read his perspective. Yeah. And funny enough, chess is my life. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about the book in a minute, but, but it basically, it was reworked from a 1978 version that came out that was originally published by Batsford. And then a year after that one came out, Anatoly Karpov also came out with a book called Chess is My Life. So, I mean, uh, of all the reasons for their rivalry, that was uh, yet another one. But uh, but Korchenoi did get there first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I mean, to tell a little bit more about the book, it was updated in 2004 by Edition Olms. Um, as far as I know, it's only in hardback. It's only a paper version. It's a beautiful book. Um, I actually got mine, like, air quotes, new. Um, it seems to be, like, as far as I could tell, it's not out of print, but maybe not abundant. But I didn't have to pay, like, an exorbitant amount. But it was just, like, it wasn't in stock on Amazon. I bought it through a, a chess dealer. You, I guess, bought it when it came out, John? I, I couldn't find the copy that I read back then. So I just, I, I bought it new when we talked about it because I, I didn't have it in my library. and Maybe just didn't make the, the move to Missouri. But I, I got mine complete with the CD-ROM. You can't not yeah, mention the CD-ROM. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it comes with a CD-ROM with all of his games, you know, very, very 2004, because at the time that would have been a nice perk, you know, but as it is now, I mean, even if you don't have chess space, you can just go to um, chessgames.com or whatever it may be and uh, check out all his games. It's about 226 pages. Um, it's a breezy read, I would say, at least until he gets a little loopy at the end. Um, but. I don't know if it's a quick read because it's just packed with stories and it kind of jumps around a bit in terms of like, I mean, the guy just had such a life with like so many events that it's like when you're reading a fiction novel with like all these characters you have to keep track of where it's like, if you're like reading it and you're tired, like you sometimes might need to do a double take. Um, did, were you able to, I mean, so this was basically your second reading, John, but did you have to do much reviewing? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of dove into it well, you know, almost like it was fresh because certainly when I first read it, it was a, was a very, very long time ago. And yeah, in some ways, for for the life and the length and all the stories he has to get it into you know two hundred twenty something pages is actually kind of in hindsight an achievement. You know, you feel like it could be one of those like Game of Thrones type books that you know you couldn't even carry on a plane and, and read it there. And so certainly it's a it's an enjoyable read. It's not you know you don't have to devote thirty hours of your life to to read this book and it's certainly one that you can you can pick pick it up and put it down but there's a there's a lot to follow and there's certainly a lot of characters you know, throughout chess history that make its way into the book yeah and um it's not the kind of it's it's not meant to be the kind of book where you jump around but it does have a lot of small chapters so you can just kind of get in and out quickly and if you're l trying to look up a certain topic like if you have a particular interest in the 78 World Championship or whatever it may be, it's pretty easy to find um, stuff like that. So what we're going to do is John and I have a unique format plan for when we dive into sort of the meat of this book that we'll reveal shortly. But first, we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. And then we're going to read a few quotes. There's so many quotes that I just 
I, I it's one of these where oh I should have mentioned it's not available on audiobook. Unfortunately, it would be perfect as an audiobook. Um, but uh, but no such luck. So we'll read a few quotes, but not as many as we would like. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood is a subscription-based instructional website founded by Grandmaster Avtek Gregorian, who you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess. Founded by Avtek and his team of Grandmasters, there's a huge library of opening, middle game, and end game videos. There's special events like webinars, streams, one-on-one blitz games. Every Chess Mood member gets a consultation call with one of the uh, Grandmaster coaches. And also be sure to check out Chess Mood's free content. Avtech has a great blog. They also have a YouTube channel where they're posting videos from Grandmasters daily. So links you need are in the show description, but be sure to check out ChessMood.com. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chess.com, up-and-coming chess site, name to watch in the space. Jokes aside, of course, Chess.com has entertaining Twitch streamers, and Puzzle Rush is always fun, even if I'm bad at it. But it also has great uh, educational materials. I'm a big fan of the drills to help you convert uh, material advantage against those super strong bots. Obviously, the game reports after every game are indispensable. Even when they're telling you that you played badly, you got to do it and learn from it. And of course, I've advocated in the past for the vision trainer, especially if you're trying to learn the coordinates so that you can read the chess books that we talk about, or if you just want to get faster with it, it's a great way to learn. So I think you know what URL to go to. Just be sure to take advantage of all the tools that chess.com has to offer. And we are back. And I'm just going to read a few quotes because this book had, and so I always get, I don't know about you guys, but I always get forewords and prefaces mixed up. I don't know the difference. <laughs> I don't, John, do you know? Before? I can't help you on that one, Ben. <laughs> okay. So I always get forward and prefaces mixed up, but this one has both by different people and an introduction. So I just wanted to give a little flavor of each. Um, I'll, um, I'll take the first one, John. And then if you want to take the forward, um, you're welcome to. Um, so the preface is by none other than Gary Kasparov and, you know, he and Korchnoi weren't best friends either, but it wasn't, it wasn't like Karpov. I mean, Kasparov, of course, um, being younger than Karpov, like came along, really ascended when Korchnoi was already past 50. Um, they did of course play in the, uh, candidates, I believe it was quarterfinals, uh, leading up to the first epic Kasparov Korchnoi match. Um, and Kasparov won relatively handily. So, I mean, they certainly had their battles, but anyway, here's what Kasparov said about Korchnoi. Um, he says, the first time I met Victor Korchnoi, I was 12 years old and playing against him in a simul in 1975 in Leningrad. Each team of seven pioneers, those were like the, the chosen kids from the Palace of Pioneers, uh, faced the other team's captains. And what captains? Karpov, Korchnoi, Smyslav, Polagayevsky. And you can imagine the rivalry between Karpov and Korchnoi to finish with the best score. My Baku team faced Korchnoi in the final round, and I will never forget the terrible energy Victor brought to bear against his young opponents as if it were a world championship match. Always that mix of passion and arrogance. That's the only way we knew. My relations with Korchnoi have had highs and lows over the years, but our mutual passion for chess has always won out. We can do nothing but admire his steadfast commitment to our game. So that was the preface. And then the foreword by a grandmaster named Sergei Ivanov. You want to take it away, John? Yeah, it was it. Of course, it comes after the preface, uh, but it was under the section called uh, "The Secret of Chess Longevity" uh, by Sergei Ivanov. Again, not not a name many folks would recognize, but certainly a pretty successful um, Leningrad slash Saint Petersburg based um, grandmaster. But his his quote is: "Victor Leovich Korchnoi is an entire era in chess. Moreover, an amazingly vivid era." one full of brilliant wins and highly painful defeats. In it, there is everything. Genius and villainy, talent and industriousness, conflicts and intrigues, legendary names, and beautiful women. Wit is sometimes replaced by taunts and admiration by disillusionment. That's a pretty good encapsulation of a lot of the book. (laughs) I have to give him credit for it. It really is. I mean, honestly, all three of the the preface, the foreword, and then the prologue by Korchnoi, which I'll read an excerpt of, like they were all three were like poetry. And I was just like rubbing my hands together, like, all right, let's go. This this is going to be great. Um, 
And here's uh, Korchnoi, what he said in his prologue. Um, Some time ago, during my first year in the West, I wrote an autobiographical book, Chess is My Life, which was translated into English, German, and Dutch. I looked carefully at what was written. Much space, too much space, was devoted to descriptions of tournaments and games. Of course, a chess player cannot get by without describing games, but there are other books and diskettes. These include... For you young listeners, diskettes are how how we used to look at games. Um, He said, these include game commentaries, but commentaries look dry. And then it is not customary to talk about the relationships between two players. And it is on human relationships that I have focused in this book. Um, So I love that quote. The very first chess books recaptured that I did with Sam Copeland about Tal's life in games. Um, That's an amazing book. I definitely recommend it for intermediate players. Um, but my one gripe with the book is that Tal led such a full life away from the board. Um, you know, just, just like insane story after insane story, uh, one or two of which we might touch upon later (laughs) in in this podcast. Um, and Tal leaves that all out. It's all about the chess. So this is like sort of the other end of the extreme. Um, and obviously they both have their place, but, uh, but I appreciated that perspective from, from Victor. Yeah, and, and you don't, I mean, there's not a lot of examples of sort of honest appraisals of the human relationships in chess, right? You know, there, there's there's not a lot of comparisons that I can think of, right? A lot of people either focused on, you know, like you said, the, the chess generally is the focus, especially for folks, you know, who are world champions and you think like kind of like the Migrate predecessor series, you know, like focuses on the chess and not the human relationships. And this is a time where, you know, we'll obviously go into it where the, the personalities and the intrigue and the complexities and the geopolitics that were involved in all of this stuff, uh, to a large extent, far more drama in the chess world, you know, then than now, you know, we have our usual Twitter beefs and stuff like that we have nowadays, but it's nothing like, you know, the Soviet state pushing on stuff. And so the fact that Korshman does go into it, given that he was, uh, he has a very unique perspective on it, having been both on the inside and outside of that is, um, yeah, I think it's really a grateful thing that he kind of put this book together. Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of listeners, of course, will, will know or at least be aware of Korchnoi's personality. But anyone who's newer to chess, um, you know, you'll get more of a sense of like what we're talking about as we get into some of our favorite stories. But I'll just say now that I was thinking of who would be like the modern analog to Korchnoi. And, you know, to me, the closest approximation is maybe someone like Fabiano and just in terms of their level in chess, someone who's a fixture in the top three to top five, but hasn't won the world championship yet. But if you think about the life of Fabiano Caruana, you know, uh, (laughs) compared compared to the life of Korchnoi, um, I mean, Fabiano, as far as I know, didn't live like a privileged childhood or anything, but a normal childhood. And then obviously, uh, you know, as a as a top 10 player who's played for the world championship, he's he seems to have, a uh, you know, stresses of competitive chess aside. He seems to have a pretty good life, whereas Korchnoi, it's just like fight after fight and drama after drama. So th- things have changed a lot. And um, yeah, I, I, I was uh, I also recently watched there's a um a documentary called closing gambit about the 1978 world championship um that i, I definitely recommend listeners check out and in it vishy anand was was quoted and he said like i don't think we're ever going back to that era which uh, i i have to agree with um so we might as well re- reveal the format now um so the format that john and i came up with for what we're going to do, because there are so many stories in this book. And that's really what it is, is a compilation of stories. So when I started to prepare for this podcast, I felt like I was just going to be reading like 20 quotes, 20 block quotes. And that didn't sound like the best like podcast format. Again, it would be great as an audio book, but I wasn't so sure. So what we decided to do is to do a top five storylines draft. Um, shout out to the podcast. I interviewed uh, Joe Posnanski, the host of uh, the podcast, by the way. Not enough people listen to that interview. I, I know he's like a sports writer, but we didn't really talk about sports. It was very entertaining, uh, as is his podcast, although it's a uh, sui generis, as they say, or I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but in any event, um, they often draft meaningless things, and we're going to draft something that may be meaningless, the top five stories uh, from this um book and john is prepped for this but john anything to say we're going to take a break before we actually start the draft but do you have anything to add 
No, you know, the, the only thing that I would say is you were comparing kind of the, 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 the time in that era to the time today. And I don't think you can map the personalities, but if you would almost imagine a world, you know, Magnus, if, imagine if Magnus Carlson decided to be like a footballer and he was playing alongside, you know, Erling Holland and, you know, the, the folks in the Norwegian soccer team, you, know, you kind of, you've seen sort of a huge churn of folks that have been number two. You know, I don't know how many folks have had the number two rating in the past, you know, 10 years, but it's a lot, you know, I know Hikaru's had it. I know Fabiano's had it. I know uh, Aronian's had it. Yeah. I, I think Wesley's maybe gotten up there, but it's been kind of this kind of constant battle. And so just kind of imagine what it would be like if all of these folks were legitimately contenders, then they are legitimate, legitimate contenders for the world championship or where it was totally open, where it was certainly for a large part of it, you know, especially before Fisher, there was no really, you know, clear head and shoulders, number one, like we've had with, you know, Fisher, Kasparov, Carlson. And so it, it kind of created all this intrigue where there's all these battling kind of groups and, um, you know, keeping that in mind, there's certainly some good analogies and it's, it's not, it's not clear who the best analogy to, to, to Karpov is, but uh, to, uh, to Korchner is, um, but certainly his style was was quite effective and he's really, really darn strong. And so the stories will be really fun to go into that. Yeah. And we should have mentioned a bit about his chess style, which, you know, maybe part of the reason I didn't is because it's a bit a bit hard to, to categorize. But most of the descriptions I came across were like he's a fighter and he's like a counter puncher, basically. So a, a bit uh, a bit hard to categorize because it's not like, oh, he's a tactical player. Oh, he's a positional player. Um, and he adapted his game in the many decades that he played. I mean, he was also known for having like a, a very wide repertoire. It was unpredictable what opening you were going to face. Um, so. All these things make it a bit hard to to, to sum up his style, but um, but I was gonna peg him, so I was gonna I was gonna go with a, with a really hot take here. I feel like Carlson is probably his best analog. Oh wow! Right? So, someone who's gonna just sit there and go like like Magnus is you know Magnus is just gonna sit there forever and he's gonna grind you down. If it's a rook end game, if it's a strategic idea, whatever he you know, he will do it right. And I think I actually think there's some, probably some pretty good analogs too, right? I would say Tal and Nakamura very very similar that was the person you were afraid to play they could beat anybody on a given day obviously get very very strong um you know it's a little bit harder with folks like you know petrosian and um you know spasky and those guys it's probably a little bit you know, harder to map but you know if you kind of think of the way magnus kind of approached his game almost through stubbornness right the amount of times we look at a magnus game and we go it's zero 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 it looks like it's totally drawn but magnus is going to make you play 40 or 50 more moves and make you suffer, and you better believe he's going to convert a lot of them. That was a lot of what you had in kind of Korchnoi's game, with just the exception of, you know, he was not as strong as, as Magnus at the end of the day. But um, that kind of style, and I think stubbornness is probably the really right word to describe Korchnoi, both on the board and off the board. But just on the board, just huge stubbornness, really good strategic play, you know, could do anything. If it was just strategic position, very tactical position, kind of a good universal style. and. Um, you know, happy to just kind of grind you down, and you know, there's there's not too many players I think fit that kind of these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his most one of his most famous wins is this rook and pawn end game against Karpov, where like he shuffles the pieces around for like 15 moves before he's like, all right, like, I guess I should try something here, and then he wins this end game in in, in beautiful style. Um, all right, well, we should get to the the draft because we, we got so much fun stuff coming. But first, we're gonna take one more break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our longtime sponsors, our original sponsors, Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to help you remember openings, tactical patterns, whatever it is that you're working on. They have a huge library of courses, including the free short and sweet versions of various openings. Speaking of openings, they just dropped Lifetime Repertoires, The London System by Grandmaster Lequang Liam. Love or hate the London, you got to know what to do against it. So be sure to take a look for that. And don't forget to sub to the How to Chess podcast hosted by yours truly. We just had Peter Fiddler on, other big guests in the works. So all the links you need are in the show description. Let's get back. Back to talking chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. Aim Chess, of course, collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you an actionable study plan. So it's a great resource for players and coaches alike. It tells you how you compare it to your rating.
grading peers in openings, end games, time management, all that stuff. It told me I was behind on the clock in 87% of my recent Blitz games. I think I might need to work on that. And thanks to Aim Chess for pointing that out. But it's a great product. Go to Aim Chess and check it out. And if you decide to try out a subscription, use the code PERPETUAL30 to save 30%. As always, the info you need is also in the show notes. And we are back and we're ready for the top five storylines of the book draft. We originally weren't going to share with each other, but out of expediency, John put his in the outline. So I may have glimpsed at them. I actually have kept mine secret, although there's no there's nothing real shocking. As, as we mentioned, the hardest thing was picking only five. But being that I am the, quote, home team and John is the visitor, we're going to let John pick first. So And, and of course, we should say we're going to go from our favorite to our fifth favorite. You can't really do a draft uh, in reverse order. So we can't count down to the best story. We're going to start with our favorites and go from there. But trust me, even number five uh, for each of us is is some craziness. Um, so and and by the way, one last thing before I kick it over to you, John, um, they won't all be sunshine and roses. You know, Courtney had a very difficult life. So we should just add that some of them are very funny and easy to kind of giggle about. But obviously, others are about hardship and stuff like that. So. All right. With that out of the way, John, you first pick You're on the clock. Thank you. So gracious, man, letting me draft first. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see if you let me do that in the fantasy baseball league, league next year. <laughs> um, I, I'm good. my favorite, and, and really the, the the favorite because it's it's the beginning of the book. It's the beginning of a story, but I feel like it explains so much, and it's so kind of critical to none of the stories make sense without it. Is is really his childhood and 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 how it explains him. You know, I mean, you hinted ab- upon it like. He had it really terrible in the war. His parents divorced. His father, di- you know, died in the war. His grandmother died in the war. You know, he he tells tales of you know starving. There's a very sad story he puts in there about how there were some boxes of cereal that were saved for when the winter kicked in. And again, remember St. Petersburg winters are not trivial. Um, and they finally went into it to to eat it, and the mice had eaten all of it. Right, and he tells these stories of sort of going off as a kid to like get some bread or trade, you know, trade something for some milk. And you know, my gut sense is whatever really happened to him was actually a lot worse than he described it. And you know, and you know, obviously war is is terrible in World War II, especially for for what the Russians went through was was terrible. But you know, it it kind of makes this sense of you know he really fled into chess to escape life. Right. And, and when you see the background that he had, it does make sense of like, hey, if I stay in chess, I can control that world. It's a much nicer world with with what I came from. And you know, I do think there was a lot of quotes, these sort of hints around it, you know, throughout it. But you know, there's, there's one quote I like on, on page 19. He says, you know, chess is a rather strange occupation for an adult person, especially if he plays the game professionally constantly. This, this person is in an unreal world. Instead of looking at the board and experiencing it, he sees only a board of 64 squares and its little pieces. They, the pieces, live their own life, but it differs sharply from what happens around, right? And you can certainly, there's certainly chess players who you think of, um, I think Ivan Chuck sort of is the first one to come to mind when I think of someone who is very on the board, focus on the board. Outside of it, you know, not a huge conception. And, and he keeps kind of talking about these like blunders he makes in life because he doesn't think through you know, everybody goes, oh, chess players think all these steps ahead. Cases where he makes like elementary blunders in life. You know, there was a story about, I guess in, in your passport back then, you would say what you were in, in terms of sort of ethnicity. And, you know, the, the, the quote unquote correct answer would have been Russian. And because of his history, he says, oh, I put down Jew. And, you know, um, the quote he gives after he's corrected on it, you know, by his family is like, you know, here's another example of my complete detachment from my surroundings. And you sort of see Korchner as someone who just like, detached from everything that is not chess, focused on chess. And you know, I think it explains a lot of him as a person and especially his conflicts down the road. You know, if you think of like things that prevented him from focusing on anything but chess made him go you know, sort of bonkers, right? He would attack those things. And obviously that caused you know a lot of their issues. And even at the very end in, in you know the in the you know the, at the end of the book he, on page two eighteen he goes, chess is my life and that's all there is to it. And yeah that's really, really true. And um, you know, and, and it's certainly something where, you know, certainly I think 
you know, as someone who only met him when he was older, even like the photos of young Korchner or something too, like he looked like the guy we think of, even if you see the pictures of as a kid in the fifties, it's the same face. And it's just weird, you know, seeing him obviously younger with, you know, a full head of hair. But, you know, I, I think the book doesn't make sense. And, and Korchner really doesn't make sense without understanding where he really came from. Yeah. Just so much trauma. And obviously with all the sort of you know, uh, sinister forces that he constantly, um, you know, felt were were working against him. Many of which were true, but some of which maybe were not. I mean, obviously, he's he had a dark view of life from what he lived through. And in terms of what you were saying about chess, chess being sort of an escape for him, yeah. And I I remember a part where he mentions that he had an early interest in like uh, music, but because he lived in this communal flat, there was no room for any musical instrument. Um, and he had an interest in, I believe it was some form of the, uh, another form of the arts, I believe it was acting, but he said his voice wasn't right for it or something like that. Um, so he, he found chess and he just obviously, uh, went all in on it. And in terms of like the, the sense of it being a place you could control, there was a, a quote where he says, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, chess occupied a completely exceptional position in a country where, so it appeared, any thinking was under control of the authorities. Chess thinking was one of those rare aspects that was not controlled. It was for this reason that Alexander Alyekin predicted the flourishing of chess in the Soviet Union. Um, and flourish it did. So, yeah, excellent pick. Uh, again, not not a bright topic, what, what he had to endure, but definitely sets the stage for picks like my number one pick, um, which is the 1978 world championship in Bagu city, Philippines. Um, uh, you know, you older school chess fans obviously are familiar with some of the storylines. I mean, honestly, I could have made five storylines from this alone. I mean, there was just so much craziness in this match. Um, I mean, first of all, like in terms of a rivalry, like everyone talks about uh, Kasparov and Karpov, but in terms of like two people absolutely just hating each other, there there was uh, there was nothing like this. I mean, prior to their 1974 match, Karpov moved to uh, St. Petersburg, which was uh, Korchnoi's territory, and took away basically his trainers and his resources. And you know, it kind of started there. Obviously, uh, Korchnoi didn't didn't like that he lost that match, and of course, famously, Korchnoi defected in 1976 in Amsterdam. Showed up. Um, at, at the embassy after he just couldn't take it anymore because he felt like he wasn't getting the opportunities to play. Um, and after he defected, his uh, son and his wife were still being detained in the Soviet Union. And, uh, that you know, as far as we know, that wasn't Karpov's decision. But Karpov was obviously like a rock star with like huge power in the Soviet system, kind of like apparatchik reputation in addition to being, you know, uh, world champion chess player. So Korchnoi felt like Karpov could have gotten his family out and didn't. So uh, the stakes couldn't be any higher going into this match. And then, you know, the Soviets felt like uh, there was still a sense that the, you know, Soviets dominated chess until Fisher, then Fisher beat Spassky. And then in 1975, Fisher didn't defend his title. So Karpov is now world champion, but there's a sort of a whiff of illegitimacy to him being the world champion, even if he doesn't have, you know, even if he's an amazing player. So they wanted Karpov to play someone. They actually like bent more than you might've thought on the conditions of the match because they wanted Karpov to play someone, but they wanted Karpov to beat someone. And especially when it turned out it was Korchnoi. So, um, yeah, so there was just so much, uh, craziness. Um, I, I feel like I, I mean, I have more to say from this match, but, but John, do you have anything to add to what I've said so far? Yeah, this. I mean, the, the the match could easily be its own book, and you know, and, and there are books about it. You know, the, the the thing I think in terms of context that's the most important, and you know, uh, you and I are born in the United States, and you know, we always think of you know, nineteen seventy two. You know, Fisher Spassky certainly by the American press was you know, positioned as this freedom versus communism kind of thing, and you know what what the Soviets preferred to do is if you left the Soviet Union, it was just you're forgotten. We're just not going to talk about you anymore. We're not going to bring you up. They kind of couldn't ignore this guy, right? They had to, you know, even internally, like they had to talk about it. It was the world championship match. It was what gave 
Karpov the legitimacy. I think it was a little unfair on Karpov to say he wasn't legitimately world champion, but Fisher was still out there and had been so strong and um, so effective. And so, you know, this was something where it was like, if you look at, a, if you think of 1972 as kind of a black eye against the Soviet Union from that perspective, the Soviet Union kind of goes into 78 saying, we're not going to make a mistake on this one. We need to make sure our guy wins. And so take that approach with, you know, Korchnoi's paranoia and you've got, and a wild cast of characters too. You know, I don't know, um, you know, how much folks sort of know the Philippines in the history of like Ferdinand Marcos, uh, probably his wife Imelda Marcos and her shoe collection is probably the most famous part of the Marcos family these days. But, you know, you've got a lot of characters who ended up in, you know, not even Manila, Baguio City in the Philippines for a world championship match with enormous, enormous stakes. Yeah. Now, yeah, as to the insanity of the story. So, I mean, and um, again, some of you obviously will will be familiar with this stuff just because it's like, it's, you know, some of the craziest stuff that's ever happened, certainly in world chess championship history and maybe just in chess history. So first of all, there's Vladimir Zukar, um, so famed uh, parapsychologist. So this guy was, Soviets brought like 20 people to this match. You know, Korchnoi has like four or five. Um, and this guy is just sitting in the front rows, just staring at Korchnoi the entire match. Um, and that seems to be his job. And Korchnoi actually had relationships with him um, as like a sort of sports psychologist from his time in the Soviet Union. And now he's there and his job seems to be to try to psych him out. So they're fighting over whether he's going to be able to play there. Um, and this, of course, um, led to Korchnoi famously wearing mirrored sunglasses in, in some of the matches. So he says, here's what he said about Zukar. Again, he said a lot, but this is just one quote. It became clear that there was a Soviet psychologist who had been brought over. Vladimir Zukar sat right behind the stage, not stirring for the full five hours. It was obvious that he was working every day with Karpov, apparently carrying out hypnotic seances with him before a game and visually encouraging the champion during the game. And then about the glasses, there was a lot of back and forth about the glasses. <clears throat> he says, the aim of the glasses was to deprive Karpov the pleasure of looking in my eye. Um, and yeah, there's you can find pictures of him of of him in the uh, mirrored sunglasses online. So that alone, the whole Zukar subplot is crazy. And eventually he did get him to not sit there. Um, but it took a lot of wrangling behind the scenes then. Um, and I'm going to go out of order a little bit because, uh, uh, I can only pick so many stories. Um, later in that match, Korchnoi starts working with, as John alluded to earlier, the Ananda Marga, this like, uh, Indian religious sect, uh, had two people there who were actually, um, uh, out on bail for attempted murder, um, and uh, and suddenly they start working with Korchnoi. He's like broadcasting him doing yoga with them. Um, they they sat at the match as an attempt to counteract Zukar. They taught him a Sanskrit phrase to say to Zukar. And he said that he said this phrase to Zukar and that it canceled the hypnosis. And then from then on, it wasn't an issue. So, I mean, like literally, if if you were to write a script, you you would be like, no, that's too crazy. Like, OK, the 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 par Zukar, that's one thing. But then to randomly have these like, you know, American hippies there that are on bail for murder. That's that's just a bridge too far. We, we can't have that in there. And then <laughs> I mean, sorry, a couple more things. There was the fame controversy about the yogurt um, court, you know, it's customary at a tournament, long tournament game to bring a snack. I think uh court mentions bringing nuts or chocolate or something. Karpov was being delivered yogurt by his handlers in the middle of every game. Um, and this caused a lot of consternation because some people are saying like, is it a signal? You know, is it like one color of the yogurt means you move one piece or is it like one color of the yogurt means you should, try to draw and another color means you should try to win. Korchnoi actually in the book alleges not those things, but alleges that he thought it had like performance enhancing drugs in there. Um, so it was certainly not customary to have someone be delivered food, like as a, you know, routinely during every round. And then there's the actual chess, but John, do you have anything to add before we get to the actual chess of this match? And the chess itself is epic. <laughs> Yeah, where, where to start? I mean, I, I love the idea of Zhukar as uh, uses the term secret rocket launcher um, <laughs> somewhere. And then, you know, you see, you see, actually, like, 
props to Corchnoy with impressive good flexibility. He's got this picture of him, you know, sort of arching his back. You know, really good yeah. world championship match with these, you know, alleged attempted murders. And um, you know, I, I, you know, the yogurt thing, you know, why not both? Why not the color of them be a signal and them have, you know, uh, who knows, greenies or whatever is, you know, in the yogurt to to make it better. But it was something where whatever weirdness happened in this match was combated with more weirdness and you know nobody nobody was interested in de-escalation and certainly you know Corchnoy is not one to back down from a fight and frankly it seems Karpov wasn't either and so you know it's just we're going to keep upping the stakes as much as we can and um you know somehow actually almost impressively that you'll go to the chest but really the chest doesn't seem to suffer <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. The, yeah, the quality of the you know the quality of the chat chess and the quality of the match. It isn't going to go into many games, but like you know, for all this nonsense off the board, you'd expect some real horrible games. But the the, the quality turns out okay, despite all these just nonsense extracurriculars. Yeah, there's a, on YouTube, there's about a five minute clip of just them playing one of the games. So they show the tournament hall, and then they like take it inside and like show the beginning of the game. And yeah, what struck me was like the quiet. It's like, it's so peaceful and serene. I mean, anyone who's ever been in a, a chess tournament hall knows like that when things are right, it can be that way. But to see, you know, to imagine that amongst this maelstrom of like absolute insanity is like amazing. And as you say, the games are like, there's some some absolute classics in this game. And it was a very dramatic match just in terms of the results. I mean, uh, there were some dr bunch of draws early. Karpov eventually pulls to it. So the format is whoever wins six games first wins. Uh, draws don't count, so it could just go a long time. But Karpov took a 4-1 lead, and then it was 5-2. to two. And then Korchnoi wins three out of four games to even it. So, the ne like, you know, it's like a game seven in sports. Like, you know, next one to win a game wins. Um, and, you know, they had asked Korchnoi at some point, like, because the Soviets were so nuts. Um, uh, like, aren't you scared for your life? And he said he wasn't scared because of the reasons we alluded to. They wanted the the um, they wanted the legitimacy of a world championship. So he wasn't scared about playing the match, but he was scared about winning the match. So I mean, obviously, when you get to 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 this game, I think it was game thirty two, where it's five to five. Like, I can't imagine the pressure he must have felt. And he says in the book, you know, this is, of course, uncorroborated, but he says that Karpov himself um, bought a plot of land, bought a villa in California uh, during the match. And he feels that if Karpov had lost, Karpov would have never gone back to the Soviet Union. Um, so just like, yeah, a lot, you know, a lot, a lot different than uh, Carlson and Nepo, who, you know, are pretty friendly and have worked together in the past and now are playing each other. Yeah. And, and the ending is what gets crazy of that match. You know, in the first 26 games, you have six decisive games total. And then it's Karpov win, Korchnoi win, Korchnoi win, draw, Korchnoi win. And then immediately after scoring at, you know, a half point out of four games, Karpov responds with, you know, the clincher to, to come in and win it. So, you know, it, it, it kind of felt like a, uh, almost a buzzer beater in chess to come up with that win. But, you know, we've, there's been a lot of historically very close world championships. We, you know, we've seen recent ones go into tie breaks, you know, you know, Bronstein bought Vinick, you know, famously tied, but this one, you know, could have gone either way. And of course, I certainly, you know, that close from being a, a very legitimate world champion. Yeah. And by the way, in addition to closing gambit, I mentioned, which you can rent on Amazon prime, I believe there's a fictionalized Russian movie coming out about this in, in like with actors and stuff. I believe it's coming out in like December or something. And one other controversy, just, just, I don't want to like, again, we can't touch on everything, but there was another controversy where Karpov in game eight suddenly doesn't shake hands with him before the match and totally puts Korchnoi on tilt. And that was the first uh, decisive result of the, of the match. Um, but you know, we're only, we've only done one pick each. So I encourage listeners who've found these stories crazy to, uh, to fire up the YouTube and, uh, or pull out a book or whatever it may be, because that match is just, there, there, there's never been anything like it, but, and, and but I, I don't want to opening shame, but you know, Corchnoy lost, you know, the, yeah. the injury with black with the a perk. perk. Yeah. He, he did play it earlier in the match. Um, you know, but it's, you know, cause he was playing, uh, the openings were kind of very, very mixed up, but certainly like, you know, world championship on the line, um, 
you know, uh, he played one of those sort of early C5, D5s that get kind of a little Benuti-ish in terms of structure. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if that would have been my go-to choice if I'm yeah, trying to I don't, for the I world championship. We'll be, but I don't think we'll be seeing the perk in this uh, upcoming world championship. Um, um, apologies to Christoph Zalecki if you're listening. You know, great, great chessable course on the perk. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a surprising choice by Korchnoi. Um, all right, you ready for pick number two, John? Yeah, the, the only way I can describe this one is, oh my God, Patrician. Um, you yeah. know, if it, you know, maybe our next draft will be like the worst human beings to become GM. And if we were going to have that draft, I don't think it would have occurred to us to put Patrician like in the top 1,000, <laughs> you know, because generally, you know, historically, you know, you think of, you know, certainly, you know, uh, you know famous Armenian legend, you, know, you think of his exchange sacrifices and stuff like that. But wow, um, you know, and almost kind of going backwards through time, you know, Korchner really feels, and again, this is one of those, his side of the story kind of things. And I think there are certainly some parts of the book you do want to take with a little bit of a grain of salt because it is certainly Korchner telling his truth um, and just how accurate, um, you know, whether it's really, really happened the way he says it did, you know, is, is hard to tell, but certainly we perceived it. And certainly Korchner did do a lot against him. Um, you know, but it, what, what really was the, the kind of final break, um, you know, was in, in 74, you know, after the first match against Karpov, um, you know, that effectively was that kind of de facto world championship match because obviously Karpov went on to not face Fisher. Um, famously, you know, there was a, an article that was written by Patricia that was published called Unsporting Grandmaster and really kind of taking him to task. And, you know, despite the litany of things that it's like, thing number 175 in Korchnoi's life that happens. But that kind of feels like the final straw for, for Korchnoi to, to really leave the uh, the USSR. But it was not the first incident, right? In in the can in the Canvas matches leading up to the court to Karpov match, Petrosian and Korchnoi played. Um, and actually Korchnoi won that match, but you know he, he alleges that Petrosian started shaking the table. Yeah. Um, he does he is a fan of like insults and quips and you know um, you know, he talks a lot about how sort of the Soviet state, um, you know, all, all of the resources that would be there to help them. And he uses a line and says, you know, uh, if Petrosian was to have played Fisher uh, against Fisher, even the devil wouldn't be able to help Petrosian. <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of like consistently, you know, even even things that are early in their career. Look, they were on Olympiad teams together. You know, they, uh, they see each other a lot throughout the, the early 70s and the 60s. Um, you know, it, it just everything is tinged with like that guy, Petrosian. You can almost just, you can hear Korshin just sneering when, you know, he kind of mentions his name. But the craziest thing about Petrosian isn't Petrosian. It's his wife. Right, yeah. I knew none of these stories. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I should have known the story. There's a famous game between F- Fisher and Kovacevic um, where Fisher actually lost. I think it was in the 60s sometimes. But Kovacevic had a better position. There's some really kind of neat, sort of swindle where it looks like Fisher sort of loses his queen, but there's like a way to sort of sacrifice and get effectively a balanced position and get out of the tough spot that Fisher was in. And back then the sort of commentary teams, I mean, Queen's Gambit actually had this pretty well. Like there would be commentary teams on site. We're used to folks being on the internet only for the streamers, but there would be commentary teams there. And so the story goes that, um, you know, the, the, the wife of Patricia basically, ran up to Kovacevic and spoke to him to tell him about this trap that's coming. The ironic thing is this actually happened. Uh, Kovacevic's version of the story is she was speaking in Russian and he didn't speak Russian. So he has no idea what she said, (laughs) Um, you know, which is certainly reasonable, but um, you know, it's not the first claim he makes. He makes the claim that, you know, Patricia's wife called Korchnoi's uh, first wife, um, not, not Petra, um, to tell her that Victor had a mistress, you know, at an event, um, Curacao 62, and we'll talk about Curacao, no doubt a little bit, uh, but apparently she was trying to talk so much to Petrosian during the game to tell them what the commentators were saying that the arbiters actually had to step in and stop her from doing it. And, you know, it, it's kind of great. It's, it's stuff that you would almost never think of today. It's actually a lot more blatant than colored yogurt. Um, you know, but it was kind of incredible how of a lot of, there's a lot of bad guys in Korchnoi's version of the story. Uh, 
it's hard to think of someone who comes out, you know, whose position is even worse. And actually, you, you compare Karpov, he does actually make the point a little bit earlier in this, before the World Championship matches that, you know, Karpov actually made a point of trying to help Korchnoi out, getting him invites to international tournaments, getting him out there. Um, you know, he does, he does just say that, you know, like Karpov you know, did a favor for me here and there. Petrosian, it's like all bad all the time and it repeatedly comes up. And, you know, of, of all the things that, is certainly I never heard about or never thought of this was this takes the cake. Yeah, it's it's an it's intense there rivalry. Yasser Sarawan described in addition to like shaking the table during the match, he's described them like kicking each other under the table during during a game. Um, he has a quote in the book um, about this is what he says about Petrosian in that tiny piece of land called the Soviet Union. The two of us could not live together. So like Petrosian's presence was like a driving force in like in his emigration, that sort of life altering decision of leaving his, his son and his wife behind um, among many other things, of course. Um, and he actually says in the book that, that Petrosian um, apologized through an intermediary late in life. Um, like saw a journalist that Korchnoi was friendly with and told him to tell him that, that he's sorry. And Korchnoi and Karpov actually patched things up too uh, late in life. So it's funny how like old age can mellow you, but they certainly weren't uh, mellow at the time. Um, as for my number two pick, um, this is actually, it's a very small part of the book, but again, there's so many little sort of, um, you know, tiny little things that that are, you know, really interesting to hear someone like Korsenoy's perspective. And those are, that's uh, his mentions of Bobby Fischer. Um, so, I mean, first of all, like pre-world championship, he kind of defends Fisher. Um, I mean, obviously, Korchnoi being sort of uh, the non-favored son in the Soviet Union might have a more sympathetic view to to Fisher than all the sort of Soviet golden boys. But this is this is what he wrote about Fisher um, prior to Fisher becoming world champion. He says it's amazing what powerful influence the Soviet press had on the media of the entire world, especially in chess. Following the example, Fisher began to be severely criticized throughout the chess world as a person who conducts himself improperly, creates scandals, and violates the elementary rules of behavior, causing countless problems to the organizers of tournaments and other participants. Meanwhile, as I recall, few players had specific grounds for complaining about Fisher. At the board, he behaved impeccably. So if you compare and contrast that, to how he describes uh, again Korchnoi and uh, and um, and Karpov and Geller and uh, so many others. I mean, it's it's a stark contrast. But then he the 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 most amazing part is after Fisher wins the world championship and has become a, a recluse, you know, um, by all indications, living in Pasadena, but basically off the grid and trying to avoid people and starting to. Um, show greater signs of uh, the mental illness that he eventually sort of succumbed to, but he tracked chess closely and followed Korchnoi and Korchnoi was on like a promotional tour of the U S and Fisher was calling him everywhere he went, um, calling him at the hotels just to, to chat. And they were reasonably friendly. So Korchnoi flew to Pasadena to meet Fisher um, and Fisher at first, when he did that, didn't even want to meet him, but he said like, come on, like I, I flew here just to meet you. Like, so like through an intermediator mediator, he gets a hold of Fisher, um, and they get together and meet. And what, uh, what Korchnoi wrote about him was he said, the first thing I noticed was that he was terribly alone. There was no, there was no man and no woman, woman with whom he could be open. We talked about many things. I was staggered by his amazing chess memory. Whatever game I mentioned, he would answer in, answer instantly, as if he himself had been thinking about that game. Um, but then uh, Korchnoi then goes on with his tour after they've met, and he told a few people that he saw Fisher. Um, and Fisher was furious, even though Korchnoi said, like within the chess community. It was it was like an open secret, like, you know, Fisher was off the grid, but everyone knew he lived in Pasadena. So for Korchnoi to say, like, I saw him in Pasadena, he didn't think was like that big a deal. But um, Fisher sent him an angry letter accusing him of being uh, in the KGB. He actually has like a picture of a letter from Fisher in the book. Um, and he says they, they never corresponded again. So just a interesting little encapsulation of uh, two legends interactions, um, both uh, 
the the good in the early days and then of course like all of fisher's friendships basically it didn't didn't end well and i think that's one of the you know if you kind of look at the differences is you know despite his sort of like just complete focus on chess Korshoi was surrounded by folks who cared about him a lot. Yeah. Right? You know, he, you know, he had two marriages that seem, you know, certainly solid. You know, I've said family members that did that and certainly compare that to, to, to Fisher who was certainly alone for, you know, a lot of that time in kind of the seventies and, and beyond. Um, you, you said there's, there's actually sort of mutual respect there and, you know, it seems like it's, pretty hard to get the respect of either of those people. And so the fact that they did respect each other, I think says something about um, each other, both on the board and off. Yeah. Yeah. And all right. I mean, again, we could go on for about all these for so long, but uh, pick number three, John, you're on the clock. Uh, yeah. So the, the arbiter in me has to pick the rules story that, that, that comes up. <laughs> so um, you were talking about a game against against Bagirov, and, and I'll make you do a little bit of make the listeners do a little bit of, of blindfold chess in this. So it's kind of a situation where Black has bishops on a six and c three, and there's a white rook on e one. That's really all you need to know. And so you've got these kind of two bishops, you know, pointing to kind of Black's left. And there's a very complicated line that he goes into that you don't need to worry about. Go through the, go through it. It's very interesting, and it's there's some of this need analysis. But basically, Yo know, goes Bishop C3 takes the bishop, to, takes the rook on E1, and then the next move is to move the other bishop. Um, but he, in his, you know, and, and this is this sometimes happens. He grabbed the wrong bishop. So instead of grabbing the bishop on C3 first um, to take the rook on E1, he just grabbed the bishop on A6. Um, and then he realized, obviously, touch move rule says you have to move it. Um, the position doesn't work with, there's no move of that bishop that is of any good. And so, frankly, any move that he makes is going to be a pretty cataclysmic blunder. So he just resigns in sort of like this weird way of like, you see him at the board, you may or may not notice he's just a piece. Next thing you know, the game's over. What the heck happened? Um, you know, it, it's certainly like, a, it's a weird situation, especially that happened at, you know, at, a, at a very, very high level. Um, it's certainly for a player who's playing for the world championship to like touch move the wrong piece, especially like not in time pressure. <laughs> like it's not like this is in some weird, you know, time scramble where they're making seven moves to make time control. They just grab the wrong bishop kind of absentmindedly. And what's kind of neat is you go through kind of court's nice history. He has a lot of weird run-ins with the rules. And I think part of this is just, this is what happens when you play several thousand games at the top level, like weird stuff is going to happen, but you know, there's actually a, in that match with Karpov in, in 1974, kind of the same thing I'll make you do, I'll make the, the listener do a little bit of blindfold, but it was one of those Catalans um, where White had given up the Fianchetto bishop on G2. And there's actually a black bishop that is controlling the long diagonal, um, actually attacking a white rook on H1 because White had not castled yet. And there's really nasty stuff happening on kind of the E file. It's kind of a neat position to look at. Um, you know, but you kind of have this weird situation where like, White's king is in a lot of trouble. Uh, White's rook on h1 is in a lot of trouble. Well, fortunately, there's a move in chess that allows you to solve both problems at once. Um, you can castle. But Korchner actually wasn't sure because the rook on h1 was attacked. And so he actually went up to the arbiter. Imagine this is round 21 of a candidate's final. And imagine you are the arbiter there. And Korchner comes up to you and goes, can I legally castle if my rook is attacked? <laughs> um, and it's like you think you would know that <laughs> especially given that you're you know arguably one of the top players in the world at that time and and he did that and that's really not his only thing with castling um there's some random game from the i don't know how to spell uh pronounce it right patui um interzonal in 1995 ag against the uh german grandmaster stefan kinderman and it looks like this very normal draw after 26 moves if you look at it it's just like this okay whatever um you know, it's a weird game the weird thing is, it isn't a 26 move long game. <laughs> um, Korchnoi's 26th move was Castle and Kingside. The problem was his 14th move was to move the rook on h8 to g8, and his 21st move was to move the rook on g8 to h8. And actually, they had computer programs back then. There was a huge time scramble, and they were actually trying to reconstruct whether or not the 40th move was made for time control. And they tried to put it into the computer, and the computer would not let Korchnoi's 26th move stand because it was illegal, and nobody had noticed it. And so um, there was a lot of kind of back and forth, and I think they eventually just agreed to a draw, just out of like, 
half we don't know what to do. We don't want to go back to move 26. We just have this time scramble. Um, but it's kind of neat how, I guess that's sort of like, kind of like the, the forest dump of chess because he's everywhere playing every single game. But when you do play that many games, you get some really weird situations on the board to kind of like uh, nicely counterbalance all the weird situations he had going on off the board. Yeah. Yeah. So many, I mean, obviously he probably played more chess than anyone. So he's going to have some, some unique situations uh, when it comes to uh, propriety and touch move and rules and all that stuff. And, and uh, yeah, again, and I think it's in the documentary, uh, Jan Timmen describes a game where uh, Korchnoi um, is playing, I think it's Karpov in a game. And I think it was a blitz tournament where it's a, it's a dead draw, like, but Karpov is still trying to torture him, still trying to win. And Korchnoi touches his king for some reason. And all king moves lose, even though in, in reality, the game's going to be a draw. So Korchnoi, to resign, throws his king across the room, like like in disgust. Um, so he he obeyed the touch move rule, but but not without some uh, anger. And of course, again, legendary for uh, insulting people. Um, you know, as uh, after they beat him, we'll we'll talk more about <laughs> your your experience with that later, John. But actually, since we're on the topic of rules, we could quickly dive into uh, Alex Friedman's uh, Patreon mailbag question. Thanks for supporting the podcast, Alex. So Alex, um, this will be a little interlude before we get back to our our draft. Alex uh, asked, he said, so Korchnoi played a game with a young Carlson, and there's a rumor Carlson lost on time thinking that they made time control because of some antics by Korchnoi. What really happened there? And Alex kindly sent a link to the game. Um, so we can explain what happened in this incident, but I'm, you know, I wasn't there, so I can't, uh, I can't shed any more light than, than what the internet says. But, uh, but John, let's at first, like set the scene a little bit more of this, uh, controversial, uh, clash of legend and future legend. Yeah. And it's, a, I mean, there's a photo with it too. And it's like, gosh, Magnus is certainly so young at the time. It's very yeah. much like, you know, yeah, he's you, got you, like you, his orange juice, like juice box. Yeah. It's such a flex, <laughs> like this like, <laughs> tiny little kid, like playing Korchnoi. Yeah. And, and, and doing quite well. You know, it was, it was yeah. actually in a, it was a, it was a pawn up rook end game for Korchnoi. And again, like, like I said, it's, it was, maybe it was this game that made me think of the similarities, but like, it's definitely the position that you know Magnus would be playing with White upon up forever, just torturing you. And, um, and this is one where maybe maybe people need context in terms of written score sheets. But um, you know, in, in you know in classical chess of, of writing your moves down, fortieth move, you, your your score sheet is the proof of of the moves. And Korchnoi, uh, I've actually seen some Korchnoi score sheets before. Uh, the the man didn't have the greatest handwriting. Most grandmasters don't, but you know, certainly some of them were kind of advanced scribbles. Um, and no doubt this was kind of the case on this one. You know, there, there, there's a claim. I don't have any reason to disbelieve. There's a book, um, Chess or Life in, in Norwegian. It's uh, Sjakin Eller Livet. I'm sure I'm butchering that. Um, all Norwegian speakers, I apologize. By by Atle Grun, who's a Norwegian I am. Uh, obviously, I haven't checked the book itself, but basically the claim says that you know, Korshua made some scribbles on his score sheet that included kind of filling in the 40th move. And you know, Magnus peeked over to the score sheet, which in and of itself is maybe a little problematic. But um, you know, Magnus sort of thought that the 40th move had been made, didn't rush. Um, the time ran out, and Magnus, to his you know, sad surprise, um, you know, found out that he had lost the game on time. You know, it's kind of like the the old lion using tricks on youngsters. Uh, that's a tale yeah. as old as time. That's not a chess thing. And you know, look, Magnus's career seemed okay afterwards. Um, you know, it didn't seem to affect him at all. But you know, certainly can't rule it out. You know, was it was it gamesmanship? Was it you know, old lion using as many tricks as he could against you know the the young Norwegian orange juice drinking cub? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, but maybe you know, hard to tell. You know, could Korchner have accidentally scribbled a move extra wrong himself? Gosh, I don't know. You know, certainly folks back then were in the habit of making your 41st move, even if you think it might be your 40th, just to get a move in there and not flag. And there was a lot, you know, it was certainly the times, I don't remember if there was a, a digital clock in there, but, you know, increments were not, um, you know, there for the majority of Korchnoi's career. And so, you know, a lot of those kind of time management tricks are ones that Korchnoi would have known. And so it's not without the realm of possibility that he was yeah. um, up to no good on this one. Yeah. And to be clear about the allegation, so often if like, especially as John says, 
when there's uh when you have like seconds left and no increment, you would stop notating on your own game. And Korchnoi, it's alleged, basically wrote in a pair of fake moves so that Car so that Carlson would relax and think that they were at move 40 when they actually were not. Um so that's what's cheating, you know. Um and as John said, there's nothing new under the sun. Like we we've seen this stuff, you know, like th this stuff has happened a thousand times. Um, as for Korchnoi, I don't, as I said, I don't have any knowledge beyond what's on the internet. It, to me, it didn't like, it didn't ring true with everything else we know about Korchnoi's personality. He's obviously uh, abrasive and an extremely poor loser, but I didn't see or hear any other allegations of like consciously cheating. Um, so, Alex, my promise to you is if and when I ever get to interview Magnus Carlsen, um, nothing's in the works, but, you know, hope springs eternal that someday that'll happen. I'll ask him about uh, about his perspective because because it would be uh, great, great to hear that. And it's not a question I've heard him uh, be asked before. Um, and with Magnus's memory, I'm pretty sure he remembers every bit of that, including whatever food he has next to the orange juice in that Tupperware container. Right, but actually, yeah. if he's and, and, and if you if you do find that photo, it's almost impressive. Like Carlson's eyesight. I, mean, I was a young kid, but like it, it, it's one of those photos that it looks like he would have a very hard time reaching across the board. You know, if he's going to play like Rook takes E1 because he had the black pieces, he looks so small on that board. So the idea that he was like peering over on Karpov's uh, on Karpov's score sheet feels weird but i'd love to hear carlson's take on that yeah i think he was 13 so he wasn't like a tiny little kid but it's it's just striking when he plays Korchnoi. um but anyway there's various reddit threads and about it but you know no one was there so we no one knows what happened um so back to the draft we still have some absolutely bonkers stories in addition to some good chess history so we were on my third pick and this might be the bonkersist um he Claimed he played uh, Jenna Maroxi, legendary 20th century player, um, you know, played from the 1900s to 1910 was his peak. He was, uh, you know, chess metrics had him as the top player in the world f during that period. But anyway, I'm burying the lead. Korchnori said he played him while he was dead. Uh, <laughs> so he, the story is that a parapsychologist friend, um, you know, obviously we know from the 1978 match that that uh, Korchnoi's into parapsychology. Um, Wolfgang Eisenbeis, president of the Swiss Association for Parapsychology and a big chess fan, uh, comes to Korchnoi and offers him the opportunity to play a dead chess player. <laughs> he says, you can pick. Who would you like to play? Um, so <laughs> so Korchnoi suggests either Karis, Capablanca, or Maroxi. So, you know, uh, Eisenbeis like then goes to his other parapsychologist friends and then reports back to Korchnoi that that Capablanca and Karis are unavailable. And Korchnoi writes about this in the book, but it's all kind of matter of fact as far as I can tell. <laughs> like it's not like this insane thing happened. It's like oh, so then this happened. Um, so anyway, they're unavailable presumably because they're like reincarnated uh, in other people so they can't they they're not there to do that but Maroxi is available so he proceeds to play Maroxi while he's he's dead um through uh um another parapsychologist who says that like when the mood strikes um the moves come to him if he starts writing the moves are transmitted to him from Maroxi and like the next move that's going to be played gets written. And this is not like an OTB game. This was more like a, a correspondence game. It took like between seven and eight years for the game to be completed. So sometimes it would be like months between moves. And I had to research this further because this is like two pages in the book, which is how crazy this book is. Um, so the, the game takes seven to eight years to play. Um, he says that Maroxi didn't play the opening particularly well, but then in the end game started to sort of buck up and gave him a reasonably tough game. Although Korchnoi was up upon by the end game and did convert, did manage to win the game. The, the score of the game is not in the book, but, uh, you can find at least the alleged score of the game online. Um, I found it and, uh, I didn't get a chance to review it too closely, but, 
Uh, Lee Chess gives um, gives deceased Maroxy a 38 average center pawn loss. He did make two blunders, but he played decently. They also say, both in the book, Korchnoi talks about this and some of the other stuff online, they asked uh, deceased Maroxy some biographical questions to prove that it was real, like so kind of obscure chess facts about both like personal details about Maroxy and stuff that he was witness to. And Maroxy mostly gets those questions right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is like a throwaway two page story within this book. I mean, I'm, uh, not, not gonna, I mean, I, I guess I won't speak about sort of the, the veracity of what may or may not happened other than what's, what's noteworthy to me is how, non-noteworthy Korchnoi found it like a you know just it's just one crazy thing after another whether whether this really happened or not I mean I think it was like broadcast on German TV so I mean he didn't make up the story whole cloth obviously there might have been some um you know there Maroxy might not have been translating the moves posthumously but 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 there was more than one person involved in this story Korchnoi didn't imagine it um this this is a lot of crazy in two pages. Yeah, you 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 don't you 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 don't you don't get that in in any chess book. And kind of my favorite is you're right. It's it's the matter of factness that's the 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 kind of crazy thing. Like he talks about this as if he would have talked about a game in the USSR championship. And I really love it. it's like you know finally in 1993 the game concluded. I right. won. Maroxy wished me success in future events. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was just totally normal. And and just the matter of fact, it, it's it's a not I mean I, I went to the game, it's like it's a winner. It's like there's you know, the, there's a, certainly a complex situation. It, it liquidates pretty quickly into a into a rook end game, but like I I don't even know where to start. I mean, certainly there's like a little bit of there's a lot of woo-woo in Korchnoi's life, certainly the Ananda Marga these parapsychologists like he yeah. has kind of this, you know, he talked about astrology at some point, you know, like he has a little bit of that, but the matter of factness is the uh, slicing on this cake. It, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Hopefully Maroxy plays someone else sometime <laughs> if he's not, not busy uh, inhabiting someone else's body. Um, so what you got for number four, John? <laughs> Uh, number four is uh, it's a good simultaneous exhibition. So it is, is a famous story of of Korchnoi and, and Che Guevara, um, not someone who appears in a lot of chess books, um, but certainly for those who never played this, I've I've been fortunate enough to play in in simuls. I happen to have draws with uh, Vishiana and Yevgeny Barev, like strong players. Generally, what happens, especially some of these like higher end simuls, is you will get dignitaries. Very often, those dignitaries, you're going to make a draw with them, make them feel good, um, you know, do all those things. You know, so traditionally, you know, in a signal, it was in Havana. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, Korchner would have, you know, tried to beat everybody, but you know, Che Guevara, a very important person, would have let him off with the draw. What does Korchner do? He crushes him because it's Korchner, and that's how he rolls. And apparently. You know, Korchner sort of says it in the sense that it seems like Korchner didn't remember saying this, but he. The way he writes it, he believes Tal telling the truth when Tal says that Korshnoi said he hasn't a clue about the Catalan Open. <laughs> like right. just, just matter like as if he was playing me and just crushed me. And obviously, um, you know, quite the revolutionary. You know, one would think that it would be a dangerous thing to crush him, but Korshnoi is just like, I'm better at chess than you. I'm going to crush you. You don't understand this opening. Tough and uh, Korshnoi just gets away with it it's pretty it's pretty wild yeah le legendary story and actually john it feeds right into to my number four pick um which sort of commences at that same trip to havana um the uh the 1966 havana olympiad um this one involves mikhail tall korchnoi and tall um go out dancing one night um after you know after the round or whatever and uh tall you know no stranger to going out after a game um and tall was dancing with a girl and uh upset someone um and got hit on the head with a bottle um and tall was already like a couple times divorced and just like tough to rein in for the the soviet union so 
um, you know, they weren't so happy that like in the middle of this tournament, which obviously the Soviet Union takes very seriously, he goes and does that. So that part, I mean, that's a crazy enough story, but that's only the prelude to fast forward two years. It's before the Lugano Olympiad in Switzerland. And, you know, Tal and Korchnoi are supposed to both be on the team. Um, Tal wasn't quite as oppressed as Korchnoi by the, the Soviet regime, but again, obviously ran afoul of their wishes um, in the way he comported himself sometimes. So here's the quote of what happens leading up to 19. 19- 68, and this is a long one, but a good story. Um, so he says, time is, pr- so they're, they're arriving to, for, you know, to leave for the Olympiad in Lugano. He says, time is pressing on Spassky, Petrosian, Geller, Poligayevsky, Tal, and I arrive with our suitcases at the sports committee for a farewell briefing, and from there directly to the airport. The chat is conducted by an old acquaintance of mine, the windbag Kazansky. There, <laughs> there is the usual twaddle, Hold high the banner of Soviet sport. Don't succumb to provocation. In the West, they incorrectly evaluated the entry of Soviet tanks into Czechoslovakia. Finally, the wishing of a safe journey and success. And suddenly, in a friendly tone, but you, Mikhail Nikemovich, can return to Riga. Smyslov is already in Lugano, and he will replace you. A familiar picture. So, I mean, let me just pause for a minute and just say, like, they, you know, not only are they not sending him, but they're doing it in, like, you know, the most like uh, embarrassing and inconvenient fashion. So, of course, when he goes on to write a familiar picture, famous grandmasters keep silent, sit without stirring with their eyes lowered. Indeed, indeed, Karis and Smyslov had set off to the FIDE Congress a week earlier. As for Tal, they had decided to remind him of his behavior in Cuba during the Olympiad. But this was done in such an insulting and humiliating way. Everyone realized this, but I was the only one to speak out. It did not concern the rest of them. It was an amazing quality of Soviet man that he declined to have his own opinion until it directly concerned him. This was certainly provoked by the year of 1937, when by slaughtering some 10 million chatterboxes, they forced all the rest to keep silent for many decades. It was, that mo- it was at that moment in the sports committee that I felt that I couldn't remain in this company. Um, so, I mean, of course, there's some levity in the sort of tall aspect of uh, having a little too much fun, but obviously that's like an extremely poignant paragraph, um, just sort of encapsulates so much of what, what Korchnoi went through, where, you know, everyone else was willing to carry water and sort of tolerate crap, and Korchnoi just couldn't abide it, and it was sort of the defining conflict of the first four decades of of his life, I mean really beyond that since it, you know, since the the world championship took place in 78 when he was 46. Um, so yeah, I mean, amazing story and really just touches on a lot of sort of the big themes of, of the book and of course of, of his life. And in some ways Tal sort of feels like the anti Korchnoi in the sense of like, you know, I, I don't know Korchnoi's experiences with alcohol, but certainly I never heard of any stories about him you know, being, you know, having any troubles with alcohol or getting into any issues, you know, sort of alcohol related. Tal obviously, um, you know, it was obviously related to a lot of the very real physical illness challenges Tal had throughout his life. And, you know, uh, alcohol was one of them. And so you think of like, you know, Korshnoi, the things that he did were things he consciously chose to do. And he, he got the feeling he kind of pitied Tal in some way of like, hey, Tal did not mean this. You know, in fact, that, you know, it was, he was just dancing like someone hit him and you know it created this whole kind of kind of story but he has a very strong sense of justice Korchnoi, and um it feels like these things sort of bit by bit start to eat at him um you know again he just wants to play and he wants everybody else to play and when he sees obstacles to that that's where he just turns red yeah although with tal's uh reputation for womanizing i mean he may have just been dancing but uh <laughs> whoever got upset may have uh may have correctly perceived tal as a threat to uh <laughs> to, to, to their their relationship um but but yeah it's uh more more craziness so we got one to go each john what what do you have for uh number five i i, I am now a proud resident of hannibal missouri with my wife and my twin boys um, but I, I, you know, I will always be a New Yorker um, at heart. And I always like to think of myself as kind of Mr. New York. I had no idea he lived in Manhattan for two years. I never heard a single story about it. Um, 
you know, it was known he played in the U.S., but he was living in the U.S. He was giving simuls in Pittsburgh. You know, uh, you know, I know you're gonna have Asa Hoffman on soon. You know, like another Mister New York. I've never heard a single story about Korchnoi at like anything New York related that wasn't like a major international event in in New York. And so, like somehow he just was in New York. Like you didn't see him at chess clubs. <laughs> like yeah. what was he doing? And like, and it's one of these, it's one of those vignettes at the end, along with like the Maroxi story, where it's just like, it's just this sort of non sequitur out of nowhere, where he lived in New York apparently from eighty to eighty two, which is actually quite the time to live in New York. You know, then apparently like mafia people keep showing up and shaking him down, and so like they come by once, they come by again. There's like a check involved and stuff like that, and then just the chapter ends. Just yeah, the way. Um, you know, and certainly I never heard of any stories about him in New York. Um, you know, I would I would like to think I would have, given that you know, um, you know certainly a lot of the folks who would have interacted with were people that I knew, but there was certainly nothing nothing of the sort. It just seems like he lived in New York for a couple of years. It's just a sort of random off the cuff thing with, with no explanation, no detail. And um, like a lot of stuff at the end, like it's just like, it, it, it asks more questions than it provides answers, but certainly it was a shocker to me. Yeah. Yeah. The mafia thing is nuts. I mean, basically after he emigrated, his son and his first wife couldn't get out for like six years and he was really turning over every leaf, trying to find a way to get them out. Um, and that's how the mafia became involved. And he basically went to them and had a conversation. And they were kind of vague about like if they were going to do anything. And then like three months later, his wife and as John said, there was like a bribery agreed to. Um, but it wasn't clear if they were going to do anything. And then then his wife and son finally do get out. But he doesn't know if the mafia was involved or not. Or not. So he's like, you know, what's the protocol here? Am I going to get killed if I don't pay them? Do I pay them? You know, I they ha- he, he, he like tries through some intermediaries to ask if they did it. And they, you know, if they had a hand in it and they don't really say anything. So he tries to save, send them a check. And I don't even remember if they ultimately took the check. But as John said, then it's just like on to the next crazy story. Um yeah, and it's just so much stuff that that we we can't even get to. Um, so for my fifth pick, I'll I'll pick a nice and short one because anyone who heard my recap of uh, my system um, knows that I you know props to Nimzovic, chess legend, um, amazing book at the time. But Korchnoi again, not one to mince words. Um, it uh, talks about a position where like Nimzovic had, you know, talked about his affinity for knights. And he talks about a position where, you know, uh, they have uh, it's the, there are knights in a closed position uh, going up against the two bishops. And then the two bishops win in pretty quick fashion. And then Korchnoi says at night, children shouldn't either read front frightening stories or Nimzovic. So disagreed with Nimzovic about the knights and uh, fired a shot at him uh you know, um, as, as a way to drill that point home. And he also, um, he had a quote, uh, with Averbach that I'm going to dig for John, but do you, do you have anything to add in the meantime? The the man had strong opinions, right. And, and, you know, you, you can disagree with them, but you get where they come from, (laughs) you know, and, and, and there's always like this, you know, there's always this humor to it, even when these are like, you know, these are real life and death situations. The drama that you know he had kind of through his life throughout his life was there, but like there's always like there's always a way that it comes across as a little bit funny, and you know, and and that was just something he just he had on him. You think of like you know, you give the cover of the book, he's got like that weird like kind of cautionary like little you know evil kind of smirk going on, and you know you you, you see that a lot in throughout the book of these these stories like this. It's it's really kind of. It's just very amusing how there's just so many. Like, there's all this is a lot in 220 pages. It's yeah. so incredible because we could we could do five more each for sure. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so the Averbach one, I ju- I just have to throw this in. So this involved the 1974 candidates match, where again there was sort of controversy about the Soviet regime favoring Karpov. Um, 
in the run-up to the match. And uh, Averbach was the president of the Soviet Chess Federation. So he writes Averbach a postcard after Averbach doesn't stand up for Korchnoi's interests and says, from cowardice to treachery is but one step, but with your attributes, you will easily overcome this distance. Sail skillfully with the wind. <laughs> so first of all, to send that in a postcard is funny. And then he says, I had in mind both Averbach's ability to play up to the strongest um, as well as his height. So, yeah, lots of insights sprinkled, I mean, insults sprinkled throughout. And, yeah, th like, you know, uh, in um, Peter Hein Nielsen and Jan Gustafsson's top 50 player thing, when they're talking about Korchnoi, they both say they played him and they were a little sad not to be insulted. And they say that they think it's because uh, they both weren't quite strong enough. Like, even though obviously both very strong grandmasters, they weren't like, you know, top top 50 players in the world. Um at least at the time. So they were a little bummed that they didn't get the full Korchnoi experience of him, like, you know, <laughs> whipping out some vicious insult when uh, when the game is over. Um, which brings us, so the draft is over. We've we've covered the, the main meat of the book, but, but John has a few uh, bonus stories from his personal interactions, one of which is, um, you know, the probably the most legendary poor sportsmanship Korchnoi story of them all. <laughs> Um, <laughs> involving uh, Sophia Polgar, which John is in the room, um, which I had known, but then John mentioned he was on the YouTube video, so I had to rewatch. And sure enough, you can you can spot John. So John, what, uh, I mean, I guess we should tell the story first, and then you could tell your your own recollection. I don't know if you want me to tell the story or you can. Obviously, you've got uh, more. Let's get, your, let's, get, let's get your version of it. Uh, okay, as, as so I mean, I just observer. have the very, I just have the very basics that that she won the game and he got quite upset and he said something like, um, "I will, I will never lose to you again." And she said something to him prior to that that, uh, according to the internet, may have triggered him. It's unclear if it was misinterpreted or um, interpreted correctly, but basically the misinterpretation would be an allusion to the fact that he should have resigned earlier, but she may have just been saying like something else. Um, so my, my interpretation is very bare bones, but you can certainly see Korchnoi insult her and leave in a huff um, and then see you lurking in the background of the video. So, <laughs> so uh, what really happened? <laughs> I'll get, I'll, let me, I have to give the full story. So the, the, I, I can't make a standing jump on this one. It has to be a little bit of a running jump. So uh, it's the term, it's in Curacao 2002, which, uh, and, and from the book, and actually, you know, we, um, we didn't talk directly about a lot of Curacao uh, 1962, which was the candidates tournament. Um, there's a lot of intrigue with that. Uh, that tournament, specifically kind of the pact of, you know, a few of the Soviet players all drawing with each other. It was a very was right, an eight right. player yeah. quadruple round robin. There's a lot of that. And so as to kind of commemorate the 40th anniversary, they brought back basically the people who were still around. So they brought back Korchnoi. Paul Benko was there for the whole two weeks. Yuri Averbach was there for two weeks. He was actually the, the arbiter. And so it was a nine round tournament, one game a day. In Curacao, I was there for the whole two weeks. And the day before the event, they had a blitz tournament. So the way they structured the blitz tournament was it was three groups of 12. Um, I actually played in the event. I was in a round robin with Sophia Polgar, Paul Benko, and Joel Salmon. I was the fourth seed. Somehow I wow. scored nine out of 11. I only lost to Benko and Salmon. I actually beat Sophia Polgar um, on time um, randomly. And so then they kind of did this thing where they went into a uh, quarterfinal matchup. So they took kind of the top eight players I made the quarterfinals, but I lost to uh, Dutch international master Hurt Ligtedink, um, one and a half, one half. The one half was just him giving me a draw in a pretty winning position. But the, the semifinals were uh, Ligtedink versus Yona Kosashvili, who is an Israeli grandmaster and the husband of Sofia Polgar, and then Polgar versus Korchnoi. And so it was basically a two-game match with tie breaks, if necessary. In the first game, Polgar actually won um with the black pieces and so the video is at the very end of game two although i think it shows some video earlier but in the end it's basically a rook and pawn versus rook um you know it'll very good elementary rook end game story course right knows he's not going to win um and then you know he just says oh, okay you win and actually that was his way of agreeing to a draw in that specific game and she makes the comment of going i, I have the respect um and, and his response to that was 
that is the very first and the very last time you will win against me in your life, in your mm-hmm. life. And so I sort of saw this coming. And so you can actually see me behind Korchnoi, um, kind of giggling to myself, but trying to stay quiet. And you see me sort of fleeing because I, I knew that, I mean, obviously I, I could tell that this was not going to go well and I could tell that he was going to react badly to this, but I knew what he was going to react even worse to, which is, isn't in the video and everybody should check it out. Uh, you know, Korshnoi Polgar, I do have to say, it's not cool what Korshnoi says. <laughs> like, you know, that was, that was not, that was not a cool thing to say in 2002. It's not a cool thing that, you know, now it was really him being a jerk. But I, 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 for some reason, I knew he wanted to storm out of there and totally leave. But I knew there was a third place playoff. And so I sort of positioned myself sort of by the elevators. And so like you see me getting out of the picture. I'm actually like running to the elevators because I wanted to be the one to tell him of, no, he actually has to play league fitting for third place. <laughs> um, and I did. And and he flipped out of me. He was like, no, no, no whatever. And his wife, Petra, uh, who you know, was always lovely, always wonderful, um, yeah, you know, I think they really made each other happy. She was, she would always be there in the audience. You know, really calmed him down, and you know, they they played alongside each other. So, you know, Kosher was playing league today, literally on the next table over. And you know, it's Polgar versus Kosher's feeling. It's husband versus wife. Um, you know, and throughout the game, Kosher is just looking over, going, "Oh, how cute the married couple is playing," and just like <laughs> just repeatedly, you know, teasing him. And it was, you know, it was hysterically. Fun. It was like it was a blitz tournament. You know, we were all drinking, you know, drinks that had blue curacao in it. You know. Um, you know, he, he was mad. He probably didn't mean it as insultingly as it was, but maybe he did because he didn't, he didn't always have kind things to say about the Polgars, but, um, it's really one of the best, you know, kind of memories, um, I ever have. And it's kind of neat that it's, you know, kind of still on video as, um, you know, probably not one of the, the highlights of Cortina's life, but certainly, you know, the man was never boring. Um, yeah. you know, there's always and- a lot of stories. Yeah, and not out, not out of character at all, as you say. Like you, you know, you say you saw it coming. Of course, you saw it coming. Cortino is playing a, playing a game. Um, yeah, in in the the closing gambit documentary, Fiddler tells the story of like after he beat him some game, Cortino immediately when they stop the clocks, he goes, "You play chess with a primitive understanding." <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he, was, <laughs> he was good, and and I got it from him the next day too. So the the next day was the turn. By the way. Korshnoi finished third in the Blitz, but he won the tournament. He scored. He ended up scoring seven out of nine in, in the main event. The, 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 the main event, the first game, I actually played Kosashvili. So I played the, the winner of the Blitz tournament um, in game one. It was actually like a highly theoretical close Rui Lopez. Um, the CD and E pawns came off, uh, but I actually made a draw in about uh, 30-something moves. Um, and so, you know, kind of effortlessly held them with a draw with black, something I probably with white, I probably something I couldn't do these days. But everyone's coming up to me congratulating me. Um, you know, and, and obviously this was like a you know, guy who was one of the favorites. You know, and Courtney kind of comes up to me and and he's like, uh, you know, what happened? Did you make a draw? And I said, yes. And he thinks for a moment and he goes, You were white. What is achievement? Um, and so like, here I am, like thinking of this great hero champion who you know, just drew a GM and you know, he points out at the white pieces. So <laughs> you know, having a draw was not a great thing, but actually, you know, the two people that tied at seven out of nine were Korchnoi and Kosharshvili and Korchnoi had better tie breaks largely because he didn't draw me. <laughs> so, right. um, so it was nice to kind of give him a leg up, you know, 40 years, basically kind of the story of that was, you know, he wins Curacao kind of. 40 years too late, but at least he, he kind of finally does it. Amazing. Yeah. And any other, uh, court story? I mean, I know you had a few others, but if, if you were to pick one more, uh, story. No, I mean, he, he was around, he, he just, like I said, he shows up sort of everywhere that I did, you know, but I always think of, you know, one of the best marketing ideas I ever had in my life was when I, I just started working for the ICC was the Las Vegas chess tournament that was going on in 1999. So it was this knockout. We now call these things the World Cups, but um, this was the first ever kind of knockout. Um, Kirzan Lumjanov um, event had 100 players in Caesars Palace, Las Vegas. And I came up with this great idea of like creating ICC accounts for every player that play there free and basically taking a floppy disk that shows you how old it is, putting Blitz in on a floppy disk, which is the, the interface software for ICC, Typing out a letter, you know, 
on letterhead, giving them their password, login information, my business card. This uh, makes I got, me feel so old. <laughs> this I mean, whole thing. This is a long time ago. There's there's like very young picture of me and Peter Swindler there. We were both. I've much, seen much that younger. picture. Yeah, Swindler uh, with the earrings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Swindler just hanging out. Um, yeah, just short like with a backpack on. It was really really neat. Uh, but I got Arbiter uh, Herc Heisen to, to actually let me put those envelopes on the table for every single person. And neatly enough, um, every single person at some point used their account with one exception. The one person who did not use that account, whether even bothered to open up the envelope or whatever, was Victor Korshak. Yeah. Um, and so it was you really, uh, you know, it, I can't believe it's been five years since he's been gone, but he was certainly, um, you know, one of the most memorable players that, that I've experienced and so yeah and what a life i mean a full life uh definitely um ran the gamut of experiences um yeah it's um so yeah i mean in closing obviously hearty recommendation for the book i mean i think it's fairly linear to extrapolate if you enjoyed this podcast um you would like the book um if you didn't you probably turned it off by now anyway so um so yeah read the book um so uh, wrapping up on a few things, um, no blindfold puzzle this month. Um, I'll see how many people complain about it, and that will determine uh, if I do one next month. Um, next month, we'll get back to hardcore chess instruction. Um, shout out to Neil Bruce. We're gonna, I'm going to be joined by Danish chess dad, Mads Jonsson, um, who is going to discuss a first book of Morphe with me. And he already sent me like a five-page outline of the book. So it's just a matter of... Uh, getting ready for a couple author interviews and then reading the book myself, which I've checked it out. I have the book and have glints at it, but now I'm going to see what all the hype is about for, for all you uh, improvers. Obviously I'm a fan of Morphe. So I think, um, I think I'll enjoy the book um, and a monthly donation in lieu of paying John for all this hard work and great stories. So um, John, uh, to whom or what should I donate this month? I am on the executive board of the U.S. Chess Federation, so it is hard to not recommend them. But I will match whatever you give as well. Awesome. As, as Thank you, John. Thing. Yeah, very generous, uh, you know, in life and with your time, obviously in doing this podcast, but even more so uh, with with the work that you and the rest of the, uh, the U.S. Chess uh, board volunteers uh, do. So thank you for that. Um, any, any big... Uh, Policy changes we should know about from the USCF board? <laughs> no, no, nothing, nothing on the political side, but just, you know, if, if I may remind folks, support your national federation. I know that it's not the US Chess Federation for, for, for everybody. You know, um, you know, state federations, local chess clubs, shops you purchase from, online sites you play on, teachers, and podcasts become a subscriber. <laughs> so support the chess community. It's been a, it's been a rough two years for everybody, but, you know, chess in some ways is kind of a hospitality industry. And, um, it's certainly been very, very badly effective. So, you know, whatever you can do to support the chess economy is is greatly appreciated. And Ben, thank you for what you're doing for chess. Um, it's really, really incredible, and, and I'm honored to be a part of it today. Oh, thanks, man. I'm living the dream. I, I'm I have uh, I don't consider what I do thankless. Put it like that. I I get a lot of great feedback and, and enjoy you know almost every moment. So I have nothing to complain about. But like you say, the the grassroots. Uh, and, and the federations, it, it can be thankless. So they definitely uh, need support. And when you give feedback, try to make it, uh, you know, a little gentler than Korchnoi might might deliver it. <laughs> um, so I think we've covered everything, right, John? I think that's it. Read, read the book, Amazing Man, um, incredible full life. Like I said, it literally spans chess history from World War II until very, very recently. And, you know, the, the man is truly, truly a legend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and John, uh, people can follow you on Twitter. If they, is there any other method if people are looking to to keep up with uh, your your chess? Uh, J Jay Fernandez on Twitter, um, probably the best. One. Jay Fernandez on sort of all the chess sites. Those are probably the best places. It's not just chess stuff. You'll get a lot of soccer. Or you'll get a lot of complaining about other sports and business and math and physics and travel and um there's just a lot of a lot of nonsense on my, my twitter page like a lot of twitter pages these days but um you know obviously if there's anything i can ever do especially since um, i do have the honor of being on the board of the uscf if there's anything i can ever do i'm i'm always here to, to help chess and help grow chess um in the u.s awesome good stuff john thanks thanks again um for everything and uh i will uh catch you on twitter awesome see you there 
Thank you to everyone who listens to and supports the podcast. And most of all, thank you to my producer, Matthew Passy. Be sure to check us out on social media. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFishel1. We also have a Perpetual Chess Facebook group where we continue the conversation about each episode. I've even got the Instagram page locked and loaded, actually posting clips every week. So you can follow at Perpetual Chess to catch some clips there. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, of course, uh, Chessable.com, the original sponsor of Perpetual Chess, Aim Chess, Chess Mood. Thanks. I'm proud to be affiliated with all of these sites. Um, also want to thank Blue Wire Podcast, with whom I partner. Big shout out to Blue Wire. Check them out for sports podcasts. But most of all, I want to thank the individuals who helped make Perpetual Chess go via PayPal or Patreon. And of course, they get to find out the guests, send in questions, hear Uh, occasional GM lectures on Zoom, um, and even get ad-free podcasts. So thank you all for supporting Perpetual Chess and keeping it going. So without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog. Shout out to JB. Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Aniti Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Campus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nilsson, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King's Cell, King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Peter McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Soddy, Philip Lummins, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gerson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, and Wayne Bean. I would also like to give thanks to... Is Viega, Adam Fowler, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadayu, sorry, Ken. Ken Kavadai, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens of Rose City Chess in Portland, Oregon, Chess for Charity in Jacksonville, Chess Pats are Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Chris, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Caros, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM, Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Perilla, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letart Lavoie, uh, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, uh, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shoot, Harish Srinivasan, Howard V. Han, uh, Jacob Kovach, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Damas, Dekumus, excuse me, Jesse, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Th- Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagor, 
Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfeller, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky of Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelie. Emil Yanova, a.k.a. Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovic, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Allen Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Milijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller-Michaels, Pablo Davida, Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management uh, Limited of Switzerland, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Sampson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malugu, The Say Chess, Publishing, Unstoppable, Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krause, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergei McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, Stephen Miller, and Tom George, uh, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko, Zhivko Stoyanov. So thanks for listening, everyone. We will catch you all next week.